All right, guys, if you can turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, and look at verse number 6. Um, it says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, have shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I decided to call the sermon tonight, Shine Out of Darkness. Just what you see there. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Because this, this chapter does cover that pretty well. So let's pick it up from verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 1. It says, Therefore... Seeing we have this ministry, we have received mercy. We, as, we, sorry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. So what we'll see in chapter number 5, that this ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. This ministry that's been referred to in this chapter is definitely soul winning. And by extension, of course, preaching the Bible to the church. So they can grow and learn. But primarily it is about winning souls. Okay, now it says there in, uh, if you remember in chapter 3, if you guys remember that far back, it was talking about the veil on Moses' face. And it spoke about how the unbelieving lost person has this veil over their heart. And uh, it's like they can't believe until the glorious light of the gospel shines upon them. Until the Lord Jesus Christ comes, removes that veil, then they can shine brightly because they've understood and believed the gospel. So this is the context there that we get in here, starting from verse number four but i love how he says that because they have this such important ministry they have received mercy of god okay meaning that this is a great work you know seeing souls saved is the greatest work any christian can do a lot of people think hey being a pastor must be the pinnacle of of, self, of uh, christianity no way the greatest pinnacle of being a christian is seeing other people saved there's no point of being a pastor who doesn't go and preach the gospel, who, you know, spends 10 years, 20 years, never seen anybody saved. You know, that person is low in the kingdom of heaven. You know, he's, he's low versus the person who might be struggling with all manners of sin, struggling with all manners of trials, but they have the heart to go and do the work that Jesus Christ has left them to do. But because it's such a great work, we need, because we're frail individuals, we're just man, we're just made of the dust of the earth, we need God's mercy and we need his help to get the job done. You know, we should never boast about our efforts of soul winning in the flesh. We should boast in the Lord because he gives us the ability to do that. He gives us mercy because we know we're not perfect. We know when we go out and knock those doors, you know, we probably have some sin we committed not long before we, we knock those doors. And we need God's mercy. We need his help. We can't do it in this flesh but because he's received mercy from god he says we faint not you know we don't get discouraged we don't get, get, get we don't give up we don't get exhausted in the work not because we're fantastic human beings but because we receive the mercy the grace of god in our lives and verse number two kind of picks up this idea of uh of hidden things and we'll see look at look at verse number two uh, but have renounced so speaking of themselves they have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty so what does it mean to be dishonest it means to not tell the truth it means to be lying and when you lie you are hiding truth right you're hiding certain things now you could tell an outright lie but you can also tell uh, half truth which is half lying okay but either way you're hiding certain things and Paul says no look I'm not an individual I'm not a preacher that goes around hiding things I make it known to all what the Word of God says and I'm not there, to, I'm not worried about offending people. You know, if the word of God says so, I'm not the kind of person that hides things through dishonesty. And then he says, not walking in craftiness. Now, please keep your finger there and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Let's understand a little bit more about craftiness. He says, hey, he's not a preacher. He's not an apostle who walks in craftiness. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Keep your finger there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, verse 14, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You know what that tells me? That tells me that we've all been there. We've all been children that have been tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. We've all been there somewhere in our life, okay? But he says, look, don't be that way anymore, okay? And then it says, and carried about, sorry, I just read that, with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. 
So being crafty is being deceptive with the way you express your doctrine, being like being, hiding certain things, quoting things a certain way, so that you're kind of hiding some truth. Paul says, no, I'm not like that. I'm not crafty in that sense, where I'm trying to toss you to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And then it says there in, in Ephesians 4.14, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So if you have a preacher that you're listening to behind the pulpit and you're kind of wondering, what is he saying? What does he mean? It doesn't seem to be very clear. It's because they're trying to deceive you. They're trying to slowly add some false doctrine into your, into your understanding. And Paul says, no, we're not like that. The preachers of God are not the ones that goes and, and hides things. You know, we preach openly, okay? And um, let me give you one example of this. When we talk about the topic of repentance, when we talk about salvation, and, you know, I believe you need to repent to be saved. I believe your faith needs to go from wherever it was and change that and place it 100% on Jesus Christ alone, his death, burial, and resurrection, okay? But then there are other Christians, and I wouldn't even call them Christians, but I guess, you know, in the world standard they're called Christians, that believe, no, you've got to repent of your sins, you need to give up certain sins, you need to stop keeping the law, you've got to clean up your life to be acceptable to God, okay? And many times churches, and by the way, this might be one reason why our church doesn't grow too fast, is because many churches hide the fact of what they truly believe. And so they get people that come in that believe the right gospel, but then they get the other half of the church that believes in a corrupted gospel. Okay, so what do they do? They get up behind the pulpit and they use craftiness, craftiness of speech to make everybody happy. You know, everybody happy. And so instead of, you know, yes, they probably preach the truth, but then they don't preach against the, the, the falsehoods. But then when they preach the truth, they say it in a way that those that believe otherwise can agree with, even though that's not what they mean. Or hopefully that's not what they mean, right? So one example of this is someone says, well, repentance is going... Is, is from going your way, have you, I don't know if you've heard this, going your way to going God's way. That's how you get saved. So you need, you need to repent to be saved, and when you repent, you've gone from your way to God's way. But that's how they leave it. They don't tell you what was your way and what is now God's way. Like, they just say that. Oh, it's like, oh, what does that mean? So, so someone like me who believes salvation by grace through faith alone will be like, okay, my way was works, I guess. My way was false religion. And now God's way, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So God's way is Jesus. So yeah, I guess I'm going my way. From, i got to go from works, trusting in that, to trusting in, in the way God's provided, which is through Jesus Christ. So I can listen to that, you know, with the crafty words and go, okay, yeah, I guess, yeah, I can make that fit what I believe. But then those that believe you've got to keep the works, those that believe you've got to stop sinning to be saved, will be like, yeah, you've got to, you've got to, your way was committing all these sins, and God's way is the commandments, God's way is the law, God's way is, is holy living, so you've got to go from living your way, the way you want to go, to living the way God wants you to go. Do you see that? And so everybody in the church is happy, because they can interpret those crafty words, the, those hidden truths, the way they want. And it makes everybody happy. But that's not how a preacher ought to be. These are instructions for those of us that want to preach, that want to teach the Word of God. Don't be that way. Don't be that way. Make sure that you preach with honesty. Make sure you preach what's clear and that everybody can understand what you're trying to say. And you know, if I sometimes say something and you're not sure, please ask me after the service. No, I'm not intentionally trying to hide something. I just, you know, I, human nature, sometimes you're not going to be able to explain things exactly the best way. But, you know, I'm open to be asked any kind of questions after the service if you have any questions about uh, what I preached. And uh, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest as to what I believe. And if I, if I, if I, if I don't have a full answer, maybe I'll, I don't even know the answer. I'll just be honest and say, look, I don't know yet. You know, you need to give me a bit of time. Give me a couple of weeks. I'll look into it and I'll get back to you. Okay? But I'd rather be honest and say, look, I don't have a full answer to that just yet than try to lie my way out of it and pretend that I know more than I do. Um, so, if we go back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, please, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, um, we didn't even finish reading that verse in verse number 2. Uh, it says, not walking in craftiness, but handling, or sorry, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. It's all the same kind of idea. You take the word of God and you make it mean something that it doesn't mean. But then it says, but, so in contrast to that, preachers ought to, but by 
manifestation of the truth. Preachers are there to reveal the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So I want you, when, when you hear me preach, to understand what I've preached and have a clear conscience of what was preached before God. It makes sense. You understand it. Yes, that makes perfect sense. And before the Lord, you know, not before me, not before other men, but before God, that made sense. You could understand what was being preached. And let me encourage you, not just for my sake, not for my flesh or anything like that, uh, but, you know, once someone's preached, whether it's me or someone else, if you got something out of that, if you learned some new truths or it was just a blessing for you that day, hey, tell the preacher, that was great preaching, I really enjoyed that. Okay? Not because we're trying to praise man, not because we're trying to edify this flesh, but because then I'll know, hey, oh yeah, you know, my preaching is commended. Is that someone's phone? Anyway, my preaching is commended of every man's conscience that heard it. And I can, I can be, all right, cool. That preaching was clear. That preaching made sense. So it's important to thank the preacher for the preaching. Because essentially they fed you the word of God and it's fed your spiritual man. Okay? But don't, don't use flattery. You know, you're not trying to praise the man. You're just trying to praise the preaching, the teaching, the words of God, which came from God, not from man. Okay? So appreciation of feedback is important. You know, we need to get feedback and, and appreciate that. But let's look, look at verse number three. <clears throat> but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now, let me just give you three ways that a believer, because he's talking about himself, right? He's talking about themselves that are saved. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So let me give you three ways that a believer can hide the gospel from a non-believer. Okay, three ways. <clears throat> so I would like all of you at some point, you know, and if physically you're not able to go and knock doors and walk, but you know, if you have friends or family, whatever, I would like all of you guys to get in the habit of giving people the gospel, you know? Um, because we don't want to hide the gospel. If we hide it, we only hide it to those that don't know it. You know, it, 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 may, it gives a disadvantage to the, the people that we love and care about. You know, that might be the opportunity to hear the gospel and get saved. If we hide it, we hide it to them that are lost. But three ways that we can hide the gospel. Um, number one is to not speak with clarity. We just spoke about how we have to manifest, you know, or reveal the truth, okay? If, if, you know, that, that means you're, you're kind of unprepared. You know, I would really encourage you if, you, if you haven't really gotten the grasp of giving the gospel, go back to those videos that I created that, you know, Soul Winning for Beginners. I try to keep it as simple as possible and do the best you can to apply that to your life, okay? Be prepared because God's going to present an opportunity where someone's there. You're going to be able to give them the gospel if you've not prepared yourself. You're not going to be able to do it. And you're going, to be able to, you're going to hide it from that person that was lost. You know, unprepared, lacking interest in learning how to present the gospel, or using words, and I don't, I've, done, I've heard this before, you know, because we're talk, talk, talking about speaking with clarity. People that are, are, are zealous to go soul winning, but then they use words that the common man doesn't understand. They speak in a way that is so hyper-spiritual, you know, using a lot of biblical language, you know, the Lord come, has come to, I don't know, you know, justify us. You know, a lot of people don't know what that word means, justification. Like, but, you, you know, you use all these words and then the person at the door is like, yeah, I guess we're going to go. No, you know, we need to preach with clarity. So even, even given the gospel, you know, you want to be able to explain the gospel using the words of God, but then explaining it down to the common man understanding. Okay? Now, and the second way that we can hide the gospel is being robotic in your presentation being robotic. So you've prepared, you know, you've got a plan to give the gospel, but, you know, instead of treating that person like a human being, instead of treating that person like they might have a different understanding to another person, instead of checking if that person's understood what you've just said before moving on to the point, you know, you're, you're so programmed in your plan that you won't deviate it. It's like, okay, this, you know, you're a sinner. Okay, the next plan, you're going to hell. The next plan, you know, Jesus came to die for you. And, you, you know, you're not checking with people to, to make sure that they've understood what you're saying. Okay, now let's pray. You know, <laughs> that's going to hide the gospel from, from people because they're not, they're, you know, you're teaching them. You know, you need to get their feedback. You need to make sure that certain points are grounded before you move on to the other things. Otherwise, they're not going to get all the other things you're talking about. 
You know, they're not going to understand that they need a saviour if you haven't told them that they're a sinner on their way to hell. If that hasn't sunk in yet, if they still think they're good enough to make it, they're going to be, at the end, at the gospel presentation, they're going to be like, well, why do I need a saviour anyway if, if I'm good enough? So, that's the second way to hide the gospel. And the third way is the most common way is just never opening your mouth. Okay, just being ashamed, being afraid, being fearful, you know, not opening your mouth, not speaking boldly the, the gospel is going to hide it from them that are lost. Okay, verse number four, verse number four. So believers can hide the gospel, which is a sad thing, but, verse number four, in whom the God of this world, and that's a reference to Satan, in whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So it's, it's bad enough if Christians are hiding the gospel, Thanks for the water, brother. Uh, but, you know, we're competing against the devil here. The Bible says that everybody that's unsaved, that's blinded to the gospel, has been blinded by the devil himself. Now, maybe not directly one-on-one, -on -one, but the devil has created all these false religions. Okay? The devil has made people think that they can, they can get to heaven by their works. You know, the, the devil has created so many distractions, has given people, especially in Australia, a lot of wealth, where they don't think they need God. They don't think they need the Savior. And so this is a spiritual battle. You know, we're not just going in, you know, just, you know, just one man and one, one man and one man. No, there's a spiritual war at fight, uh, uh, being fought there. The devil there is trying to keep that person's mind blinded. But what's going to shine the light on them is, the, in verse number four, the glorious gospel of Christ. The gospel is glorious. You know, it, it's full of light. And that we should shine unto them. You know, it says there, uh, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Amen. Spiritual battle. First John 4, 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Make sure when you go and preach the gospel, you don't do it in the flesh. Make sure you spend at least a few minutes praying to God, asking Him to fill you with the power of the Holy Ghost because it's the Holy Ghost that is in you that's, that's greater than the one that is in the world because the one in the world has blinded their minds. We need the power of God. We're just fragile human beings. We'll see later on we're just these earthly vessels that are fragile and can break, but we can do great things through the power of God. Okay? You know, preaching the gospel, if we look at the reference there, because it talks about the, you know, the minds being blinded and we come with this light. Preaching the gospel is like explaining light to a man that's been born blind. Now, trying to, someone that's been born, uh, has been blind since birth, you trying to explain light to them, very, very difficult, right? Very difficult. And sometimes these men prefer to stay blind uh, out, of, out of their own pride. No, I'm not blind. No, I don't need that light. And so it takes work. Don't think you're going to get there, 10 minutes done, you know, some people, you really need to work on it. You know, uh, make sure you're not wasting your time. But hey, it, it, it takes work, okay, to, to make... You know, Christ came and he made the blind to see. But we're doing exactly the same thing when we're able to preach the gospel and lead people uh, to salvation. And that's a greater thing, right? Because that's a spiritual thing. That's eternity. That's soul safe forever than just receiving, you know, sight for a temporary life. It's a greater thing to see souls saved. Let's look at verse number five. For we preach not ourselves. <laughs> a lot of people need to hear that. <laughs> okay? It's not about you. You're not preaching about you, about how good you are. You're preaching, it says, but Christ Jesus, the Lord. That's what we're preaching at the door. The Lord, the Christ Jesus, what he's done for us. And then it says, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. So don't preach about yourself. Now, have you ever knocked on a Pentecostal's door trying to give them the gospel that it's all done by Christ? And what do they want to preach in return? Themselves. Oh, but have you spoken in tongues? You know, I've risen people from the dead. You know, I've, I've healed this person, you know, from their whatever, you know, illness or disability that they had. That's their gospel. Their gospel is all about themselves. Look what I've done. 
I must be right because I'm doing all these great works for God. And what's Jesus going to say? I've never, I, I never knew you. Depart from me. Okay, because they're not trusting in Christ. And I remember taking a friend of mine, and it's not his fault, his first time soul winning. And, uh, you know, he got out first, finally got him out to go door to door with me. We got a guy saved. You know, it's always exciting when you take a first time person and they, get, they see salvation that first time. It's, it's really encouraging to them. So it's always exciting. Uh, but, you know, I finished giving the guy the gospel. He got saved and he was really excited. But then he said to me, but why didn't you tell him like how great your life is after, like since receiving Jesus Christ? Why, haven't you, why didn't you tell him how much now you've grown in the Lord, how you've been able to, you know, live a more clean and holy life and how you've grown in knowledge for the, in the Lord? And that's because I'm not preaching myself, <laughs> right? Um, well, that's number one. But number two, that doesn't really prove anything. Because someone that's trusting in works, as soon as you start saying to them, and look, I'm not against talking about how wonderful it is to have Christ in your life. It is. It's, it's, it's amazing, okay? Because you have the power of God in you. I'm not trying to diminish that whatsoever. But when you're talking to someone that thinks it's about how, to, how you know, salvation is how you live your life, and then you throw in during your gospel presentation, about how much your life has changed having Christ in you, immediately they're going to uh, attract, that's going to attract them because that's, going, that's similar to what they believed. Oh yeah, so you do have to live a clean life to be saved. That's why you put that aside. Okay? You put aside your self-boasting or whatever, your self-pride, and just preach the simplicity of the gospel in Christ Jesus. I like how he says, and ourselves, at that verse number five, and ourselves, your servants... For Jesus' sake. So he goes, you know, we don't preach about ourselves. You know, we're just your servants. You know, and, and me as a pastor, yes, I have the authority in this church, but in reality, I'm supposed to be your servant. I'm supposed to come and minister to you. You know, I'm supposed to lower myself and, and hold you guys high in regard. You know, I come and preach a sermon, not to, not to glorify myself, but to edify you, you know, to, to feed you the words of God. I love that about Paul. You know, he always brings back to, in remembrance, hey, I'm just your servant. You know, I'm just your humble servant for Jesus' sake. Verse number six. For God, now this is a reference, I believe, of Genesis. So you can turn to Genesis if you want. Keep your finger there in, in 2 Corinthians 4. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We'll just have a look at that very quickly. It says, for God who command... Uh, actually, let's, let's go straight to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. What's the first thing that God creates once he's established the heaven and the earth? He says, it says that it's, uh, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It was completely dark. And verse number three, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. I don't know if you picked that up there. You know, when we turned on these lights, the darkness fled immediately, right? But it's like God didn't just create the light, but then he divided it. So he had to put the laws into place. I don't know if you picked that up. Because, you know, light travels, light moves, the speed of light. And so God had to create, not just create light, but create the law that it moves and that it separates from the darkness. Okay, but now let's look about, back at uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 6. Just to get that, because I think that's what it's referring to here in verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, have shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I love how, you know, given the gospel there, is, the, is, is, is shining the light. And he compares it to creation. Right? Compares it to creation. We think about how, how great creation was, that God brought all these things into place, and they did amazing miracles, and he goes, yeah, that's like, that's like when you get people saved. It's like when you give the gospel, you're, you have this light that shines out of darkness. You know? Uh, and the presence of light causes darkness to cease. You know, you don't have to turn on darkness, you have to turn on the light. You know, and as Christians, we need to make sure we turn on the light. We shine brightly to the people that are lost, to the people that need to hear the word of God. And this world is in great spiritual darkness. It's getting worse. I mean, how many times, 
if in the last couple of weeks, I don't know how many people have told me, we must be in the last days. Like, it's getting so bad. Like, just everything around the world, uh, we must, look, I don't know. It could be. And I think about Australian mothers. I mean, you're telling me about some guy in Sydney that had murdered his two daughters and then killed himself? I, I didn't hear about that. And, and look, that's horrible. But don't forget, there's 250 babies being murdered every day in, in, in Australia. You know, so that's like 252, you know. But look, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, that's bad. But so much worse is going on every single day in our nation. You know, false religions are growing out in our nation. Denial of God's existence is taught in our nation's schools. You know, complaining on Facebook is not going to fix things. I'm sorry to say, you Facebook addicts. <laughs> complaining on Facebook and creating memes, sorry Jason, is not going to fix things in this world, okay? That's why we need to go out with that glorious light, shine it in this world of darkness, this world that has been blinded by Satan. That's our job. Could you imagine that if every true Christian, every true believer would just get out there on, in the community and shine some light? I think we could turn this nation around. I think so. You know, why not? We saw Israel in the Old Testament. How many times were they so wicked doing just sacrificing their children? That sermon that you gave us of that King Manasseh. You know, so wicked. And yet when you turn your heart to God, you start doing the works for God. How much God can be merciful and heal a nation. I believe we can still do that. Okay? And complaining about the world's not going to do it. It's the gospel. Okay? Getting into politics is not going to do it. It's the gospel. That's the only thing that's going to fix this nation. Okay? We need to bring the righteousness of Christ into the hearts of the people here rather than think we need to fix their righteousness. No. You know, their righteousness are as filthy rags. We need to bring the righteousness of Christ into their life. You know, 1 Peter 4.17, uh, the first part of it says, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. The house of God being the church. You know, yes, the world's horrible, but are we doing enough, really? You know, are we, are we doing the best we can to shine a light? You know, are, are we trying to live after the Lord and, and trying to be a witness in the society? You know, I'm glad we are. I'm glad that every week we're, we're going out knocking doors. But again, could you imagine if every church that believed the right gospel was doing this? It'd be amazing. Verse number seven. Verse number seven. But we have this treasure. Oh, this was the memory verse. Did you guys, did anyone quote it on Sunday? No. No? Oh, okay. Should, <laughs> oh, it's too late now because everyone's looking at it. All right. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So our, our, talking about our bodies. And this treasure is the light of the gospel. Okay. It's the light of Christ. Okay. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So if you say to me, you know, Pastor Kevin, I can't do it. I can't preach the gospel. Well, that's true. You know, you can't really. You know, because you're just an earthen vessel. But that's, you're the one that God wants to use. He wants that weakness, that humility, that person that says, I, I'm nothing really, Lord. That's the one he wants to use. Why? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So when we go out and knock those doors and we see people saved, hey, it's not our physical ability. Yes, we need to subject our bodies and do the work, but that power, the ability comes from God. It's God that receives the glory. Okay? So please don't think I'm too timid, I'm too weak, I'm just an earthen vessel. Hey, you've been given this treasure, it says there in verse number seven, this glorious light, this treasure. You just allow the power of God to work in you. That sounds charismatic. But yeah, it's true. You, you let the excellency of the power of God, yeah, you can accomplish this great work that he's left us to do, you know? And let me just say, look after your physical body. It's already weak. It's already fragile. It's already going to get sicknesses and, and uh, you're already going to have troubles in this life. You know, I don't know, if maybe we won't all see till 75. What's, is that the average age, 75? You know, try to look after your body, not because, you know, you need to look great with a six-pack or anything like that, but just so you can do more work for the Lord, so you can be here longer, you can have more energy knocking those doors and giving the gospel. Look after that body, because that, that is the body that God wants to use uh, to get the gospel out. Verse number eight. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, 
but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed. So in light of our bodies being these earthen vessels, these fragile bodies, you know, the Bible says that we face troubles and persecution. Please, don't promise someone if you get saved, it's all going to be good. <laughs> it's, it's going to be just as challenging. Okay, There's going to be just the same amount of trials. In fact, there might be even more for his name's sake. Okay? Uh, but because we have the power of God in us, we can face this tribulation and not become distressed, not become uh, not despair in our life. So think about, think about an unsaved person without the Lord Jesus Christ. They go through the troubles, but they'll stress about it. Okay? They'll, they'll, they'll be perplexed and they'll despair about it. Okay? That's the flesh. And if you find yourself doing that, hey, that's, that's the flesh as well. You, know, you need to walk in the new man. You need to seek the power of God. Yes, you know, life is always going to bring its challenges. Life is going to bring its troubles. Whatever it is, it's your finances or if it's your relationships. Whatever trouble you might be in, but with the power of God, we don't need to uh, be cast down. It says persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. We don't need to be that man that killed his two daughters and then killed himself. That's a man without Christ. That's a man that was uh, uh, destroyed. He destroyed himself. But had he, had he relied on the Lord, had he gotten saved and trusted in Jesus Christ, had the power of God in him, hey, he would have been able to, to overcome whatever difficulty he had in his life. As long as you rely on the Lord, again, don't think you're going to rely on your own strength and get through it. Or otherwise, you just might as well be kind of like an unsaved person without the power of God that you're relying on. Okay? And I love how it says persecuted but not forsaken. Okay? Persecuted by this world, being thrown into prison, being arrested or whatever you know, might come your way. God says, but I won't forsake you. you know, you'll always have somebody. Even if your, whole, your friends turn against you, even if your family turns against you, he says, not forsaken, because that's, that's God. God's there with you. God's never going to uh, turn his back on, on his own children. Verse number 10. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. So all this persecution and troubles that he has in the flesh, he relates that to like dying, the dying, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only that, I mean, yeah, that's, that's the hard side of it. And then it says that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Okay? So, again, just talking about the weakness of our flesh, the troubles that we have. Hey, yeah, we see that at the sufferings of Christ that we get have in us as Christians, but the fact that he can do these great works, the fact that he, that he can be a blessing to other believers, that he can teach people the word of God, and that he has his treasure, shows that he has the life of Jesus Christ, that resurrection, if you will, made manifest in his body. Okay? So, uh, what I'm trying to say there is that typically Christians want a life to represent the fullness of life that Jesus has given them, but without the suffering. That's what Christians typically want. Okay? Um, what, what's the, uh, the Pentecostals again? Sorry. Um, the, what do they call it? The prosperity gospel. They want all the prosperity. They want all the things going really well, but they don't want the suffering. Is that what Paul says here? You know, he gets the suffering and, and the, the, the life manifested in his body. They, they both come together. Okay? A believer who has little to no work for Jesus Christ will in likeness experience little to no suffering or persecution. So if you really want no suffering, no persecution, just don't do anything for God. But then you won't get the benefits. You won't get the blessings. You won't get the rewards. You won't be able to manifest that light uh, that you have and, and show how Jesus Christ is working in you. You know, you can't have one without the other. You know, the Christian that does great things, guess what? They suffer great persecution. Those, you can't have one without the other. Okay? So if you want to do the great works for God, then prepare yourself to suffer a little bit for his sake, namesake. Prepare to uh, have that body which is sort of dying, representing the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can also have the new life that he gives you in the, in the works that you can perform. Verse number 11. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. So in order for sinners, pay attention now, in order for sinners to receive eternal life, someone else must have death work in them. You've got to suffer a little bit to give birth. 
You know, when, when, a, when a woman is in travail and she's going to deliver that newborn baby, she suffers a great deal. It's a lot of work, okay? It's a lot of stress on her body, okay? You can't have someone saved without some type of work or some type of suffering. I don't know if you picked that up before. You get someone saved, you died a little bit. Like spiritually, you, you did some work and it, it, it caused some suffering in you, some travail. And yeah, maybe you won't see it physically, but spiritually or emotionally or mentally, hey, soul winning is not an easy job. You know, don't think it's just going out for a leisurely sh- stroll and having some chit chat with the neighbors. No, it's a great spiritual work. Okay, it, that's why it's hard to do it. That's why it's hard to wake up in the morning and go, I'm going soul winning today. Because you know it's a strain on your spiritual uh, uh, mind. It's a strain uh, uh, on you to, to, bring, back, to bring forth uh, someone uh, to be saved. Okay? And this is, again, this is why many Christians don't do any active soul winning. Because it's work. You know, just if someone's out soul winning, you know, don't make them feel bad. If they're, if they're doing a bad job, you know, encourage them, try to help them, try to sharpen the way they can give the gospel. You know, don't put them down because, they're, you know, it's a strain. It's, it's hard work. You know, and you need a lot of practice. You need a lot of work to get good at it. Take it seriously. Verse 13. We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Now, I think this is pretty interesting. If you can, guys, keep your finger there again and turn to Psalm 116. I've told you before, when the Bible says, according as it is written or anything like this, go back and have a look at where it's written to get a lot more out of it, okay? So Paul says that he has, or we have, you know, the Corinthian church, Paul, ourselves, we have the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. So Psalm 116, verse 10, and this is where it comes from. Psalm 116, verse 10, it says, I believed, therefore have I spoken, I was, I was greatly afflicted. So that's where it's coming from. Now let's look, drop down to verse 13 quickly there. It says, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Okay? So verse 13 is talking about taking the cup of salvation, getting saved, calling upon the name of the Lord, okay? I believe that's the primary, ap- primary application to the psalm, but then in the New Testament, Paul takes that writing in verse number 10 and applies it today. He says, we have in the same spirit of faith. Psalm 116 was written by King David. And, and, and Paul is saying, hey, we have the same spirit of faith that King David had when he wrote these things. You know, uh, according as written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. And so when we talk about, you know, just leading someone in prayer or calling upon the name of the Lord, it's not some additional work that they need to do. It's just an expression of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's that same faith that will then cause you to speak the words of God. It's the same faith that will cause you to go and preach the gospel to other people. Because he's applying this not to his personal salvation, but he's applying this to him preaching the gospel to the unsaved. So verse 13 there in Psalm 116 is a reference of salvation, but the same spirit of faith in verse 10 is applicable to us, to us speaking the gospel because we've believed. We believe the gospel, so that's why we speak the gospel. That's why we go and preach the gospel, because we believe it. Okay? And doesn't this reinforce the fact that it's the same spirit of faith that the Old Testament saints were saved in the same way? It's the same spirit of faith. The way David was saved, was calling upon the name of the Lord in faith. You know, it's the same thing that Paul is preaching to sinners today, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Verse 14. 2 Corinthians 4, 14. <clears throat> knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up also sorry shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. So here it's just talking about the assurance of the resurrection from the dead. You know, yes, God raised up Jesus Christ, and we too will have that resurrection. Okay, and we, we sort of go into the resurrection in the next chapter, so I won't talk about too much about it. 
Uh, but it says, what's interesting there, it's at the end of it, it says, and shall present us with you. So it says, when at the resurrection, Paul will be presented with this Corinthian church. But if it's the same spirit of faith that King David had, then King David is going to also be presented on that same day. And a lot of people think the rapture is just for the New Testament church. The resurrection of the dead just for the New Testament. No, it's not just the New Testament church. It's all the believers that have gone before. They're all going to be resurrected from the dead. It's the same spirit of faith. It's not some other spirit of faith. It's the same one. And we're all going to be raised together. And we're all going to be presented together uh, with God. So not only will we experience the resurrection ourselves, but we're going to see Paul there. We're going to see the Corinthian church there. We're going to see King David there on that day caught up in the clouds together. Not just our loved ones, but all these saints that have gone before us. Verse 15. Verse 15. And all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Now that word redound just means results in. So uh, that the abundance of grace might through the thanksgiving of many result in or to the glory of God of God. Okay, so all the sufferings and trials that, you know, Paul has gone through um, are there to be received with thanksgiving, because God is using those trials and tribulations in his life to help edify this church. Okay, you know, uh, Paul, um, obviously, you know, uh, st- you know um, uh, working in the ministry, getting people saved, you know, writing these epistles, you know, we saw that he did it in tears, Okay, in all the persecution, the people praying for him, every situation can bring glory to God. It's not just when things are going well, but when things are going uh, not well, when things aren't going well at all, hey, it can still bring glory to God. Let me encourage you, whenever something's not working for you, whenever you're struggling, just remind yourself, this can somehow bring glory to God. Okay? And God, God is using this situation that I'm in, this struggle, to strengthen me, just like the struggles of Paul were strengthening the church, and they were give, receiving it with thanksgiving to the glory of God. Okay? And sometimes we don't know. You know, when we're going through that difficulty, it's like, God, why are you allowing me to go through this? But then sometimes in hindsight, you look back, oh yeah, God had a purpose. There was a plan for that. Hey, I've matured. I've grown. Or now my brother is going through that difficulty. I've gone through that as well. I can give them encouragement. I can motivate them. I can tell them, hey, it's going to be all right because I've gone through a similar thing that uh, that you have gone through. So always think about, hey, how can God use the difficulties that I'm going through for his glory? Verse 16, for which cause we faint not. This is going back to verse number one when he says that, you know, they don't faint. Uh, But though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You guys might remember, you know, the teaching of the new life, the new man, the new creature, the spirit. Here they call it the inward man. It's all these names for the same part of you that's been born of God, that's born of the spirit, okay? The outward man perishes, you know, but the inward man is renewed day by day. You know, the the inward man is that new creature that remains untainted, Okay, it's glorious. It's without sin. And I love how it says it's renewed day by day, meaning that every day it's like it's new. It never grows old. You know, I I told you guys, even if you destroy your life as a saved person, you go into sin and you just, you know, you're the worst example of a Christian. You can always just press that reset button because day, you know, that, that new man is renewed day by day. He remains untainted and you can step into that new man and start serving the Lord once again. I love, I love that, that. And remember how I told you how important that doctrine was, the new man and the old man? Because the Bible's filled with this stuff. And if you, you miss it, you struggle. People struggle with these kind of teachings because they don't understand what is the old man that perishes and what is the new man that, that is renewed day by day. <clears throat> and verse 17. And you might go, well, I, I don't want that outward, outward man to perish. I don't want to suffer for Christ. But look at verse 17. For our light affliction... And it's kind of like, again, I think Paul's being a bit sarcastic here, right? Because he's gone through times where, you know, he thought he's going to be put to death or, or die. You know, he's, he's been beaten. He's been, he's, he's gone through every type of trial that you can imagine if you read about the life of Paul. And he goes, oh, it's our light affliction. It's only a little bit. It's only suffering a little bit. Well, in relation to what, Paul? 
which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So in comparison to eternity, the great sufferings that he's having is just light affliction. Because it's just temporary. It's just for a period of time. You know, and uh, you know, his focus is on the eternal weight of glory. He's thinking about eternity. He's thinking about all this suffering that I'm doing for Christ. Wow, what great rewards are there going to be in eternity when I see God face to face? You know, it's all going to be worth it. All that suffering that I had is going to be worth it. And let me just say to you, hey, uh, Christian, Bible Christian, you're not going to hear behind this pulpit that your, all your problems are going to get solved. You know, you're always going to have a nice life. No, you're going to be hearing what the Word of God says, and that's that, that's that you're going to go through trials as a Christian. Okay? But have Paul's mindset. Hey, it's just light affliction. It's just temporary. You know, we've, I mean, think about it all eternity. And think about the 70 or 80, 90, 100 years that you've got on this earth compared to forever. It's just a light affliction. And this is the time to think about eternity. This is the time to earn your rewards for Him. So, look, you're going to suffer anyway in this life. You might as well suffer for Christ's name's sake. And get the rewards in heaven. Okay? I love verse 18 as well. While we look not at the things which are seen, so we don't look at the things that are temporal, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know, set your eyes on eternity. That's actually my first sermon that I ever preached to you guys. Um, it was before the church launch. It was on Saturday at the Soul Winning Marathon. I said to you guys, we need to set our eyes on eternity. You know, whatever this church is doing, we need to make sure, hey, what, how does this apply for eternity? You know, I don't want to waste our time doing fleshly, temporal things that have no eternal rewards, that doesn't benefit anything. You know, I don't want to just put on some, I don't know, what do churches do? Uh, uh, puppet show. Well, I guess if the puppet show is given the gospel, I guess it could be used for eternal glory if you're teaching children or something like that. I don't know. There's a lot of practices. There's a lot of activities that are temporal. There are a lot of activities that just don't do anything spiritually that a lot of churches get bogged down in. I just want to keep things simple as possible right here and make sure that the, the works that we do are for eternity. Okay? It's the best way to view your life is that everything now is temporary. It's the best way. It'll, it'll stop you from getting selfish. It'll stop you from trying to chase, you know, money in life because, you know, you're not going to have it forever, whatever you, whatever you earn. You know, it's always go, it's going to encourage you in your difficulties because, you know, what, it's going to end anyway. And it's going to encourage you in your illnesses and your, you know, your bad health because, yeah, well, God's going to give me a resurrected body in eternity and I'm going to be able to live forever for him. So having that, and the eyes of eternity are really going to help you live a more fuller, more holy life that's pleasing to God. I'll just read to you very quickly uh, from John 17, 14. <clears throat> John 17, 14. Uh, Jesus says, I have given them, so Jesus speaking to the Father about his disciples, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So if you're saved today, yes, you live in this world, but Jesus says, you're not of this world. Now, don't, don't be working your life for this world. Now have the eyes for eternity. Then it says in verse 15, <clears throat> I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So Jesus Christ says, you're not of the world, but I don't want you out of this world. I just, you know, God, you know Jesus is praying that we would be protected from evil, that we would be protected from harm, because we have so much to do in this world right now. We have so many souls to see saved. We, we, we can live a life that's pleasing and holy to God, you know, serve one another, fellowship with one another, have sweet fellowship with God. We can experience a little bit of that eternity right now. We can experience a little bit of heaven right now if we just walk in the Spirit and seek to serve the Lord with our lives. You know, we need to spend more time you know, seeking and investing in the kingdom of God and be motivated by the, the rewards to come. That's what drove Paul. That's what got him going, even through the difficulties. That's what's going to get you through your difficulties, focusing on eternity and the rewards that we can get from, uh, from God in heaven. Let's pray.